Hello everybody, I'm Joe Lombardo, co-coordinator of the United National Anti-War Coalition. Thank you all for being here. This panel um, is called Opposing Imperialist Wars. And our first speaker is Bayman Azad. Uh, Bayman is an Iranian-American peace activist. Bayman, Bayman. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I get it wrong all the time. And he's a close friend of mine. Um, peace activist who has been involved in struggles for peace and justice since 1970s. Um, he is the executive secretary of the U.S. Peace Council, a representative of the World Peace Council of the United Nations, and a member of the administrative committee of UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition. He is a co-chair of Venezuelan Embassy Protectors, uh, helped organize the fight for those folks that um, held the embassy for 31 days against the right-wing coup leaders who wanted to take it over. Um, he is the coordinator of the Coalition Against U.S. Uh, foreign Military Bases. He's a co-coordinator of the Hands Off Syria Coalition and um, the People's Mobilization chair of the Iranian Working Group of Veterans for Peace. Don't ask him what he does in his free time. Um, so uh, I'll let Damon take the microphone now. Greetings, comrades and friends. Greetings. Greetings. I am honored to speak uh, tonight on, in my dual capacity as the Executive Secretary of the U.S. Peace Council and member of the Administrative Con Committee of UNAC. In both capacities, I greet and salute all of you and wish you this, this great conference a tremendous success. U.S. Peace Council and UNAC, as two of the head leading anti-imperialist contingents of the peace movement, U.S. Peace Movement, have a long history of close cooperation with each other. Together, we have organized very significant events in the past few years. As all of you are well aware, uh, the U.S. peace movement has a long history of struggle against imperialism's interventions in the internal affairs of other countries. But this history has had frequent ebbs and flows in different periods depending on the political situation of the time. The massive demonstrations that appeared before George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq, during which close to half a million anti-war people marched in Washington, D.C., dissipated after the start of the war and later went into hibernation with the election of Ajamu Bar uh, uh, Barack Obama. <laughs> We are so much closely working together that Ajamu is a common word for me. Um, a prediction for the future. <laughs> Although the warmongering policies of U.S. imperialism continued and even intensified during the Obama administration, the U.S. peace movement remained rem relatively quiet in the fear of not attacking the first black president of the country. This also caused a deepening fragmentation within the peace movement with regard to how to respond to Obama's intensified military policies. While the left and anti-imperialist forces continued their active opposition to Obama's administration's uh, interventionist policies, the more liberal forces limited themselves to signing petitions and appealing to various government authorities for policy changes. The election of Donald Trump as president, however, created a, a potential for reviving the peace movement once again. It removed all the masks and pretensions by openly threatening several countries with regime change and imposing or intensifying illegal US sanctions against the targeted countries, especially Syria, Iran, and Venezuela. Trump's blatant imperialist threats also brought to the fore the conflict between the anti-imperialist and the liberal center forces within the peace movement. The liberal center forces under the influence of president, pres, persistent media demonization of the leaders of nations like Iran, Syria, Venezuela, and even Russia, 
refused to take side against U.S. imperialism interventions with the phony excuse that so-called both sides are bad. This was a great opportunity for the U.S. Peace Council and the leading organizations in UNAC to bring the left and anti-imperialist peace forces together and initiate the formation of a united front that would be able to force the whole peace movement to take side against imperialist interventions. Considering the U.S. foreign military bases as the main instrument and the launching pad of all U.S. imperialism's military aggressions around the world, Together, we drafted a unity statement and presented to the, our anti-imperialist allies in the peace movement for the creation of the broadest anti-imperialist coalition in the United States after several decades, namely the coalition against U.S. foreign military bases. The new coalition brought together for the first time a broad range of forces, including some significant segments of liberal center forces that had refused to take side against imperialism in the past. This coalition was further expanded into global campaign against U.S. NATO military bases. The result of these events was, these efforts was the convening of two tremendously successful and popular anti-basis conferences, first in Baltimore, Maryland in 2000, January 2018, and second, an international one in Dublin, Ireland in November 2018. Those conferences were clear indications that we were successfully moving toward the creation of a unified anti-imperialist peace movement in the United States and around the world, although a lot of work was still needed for us to reach that important goal. With the intensification of the attacks on Venezuela, the U.S. Peace Council decided that it was time for, the, for us to repeat what we did in 2016 with regard to U.S. intervention in Syria, i.e. sending a high-level peace solidar and solidarity delegation consisting of the top leaders of the U.S. peace and justice movement to Venezuela. So we invited the leading members of our allied organization in the anti-basis coalition, which included many leading organizations of UNAC, and every one of them agreed to join the delegation and thanks to the selfless and dedicated support from the, our sister organization in Venezuela, COSI, the U.S. Peace Council delegations was rapidly organized and was able to travel to Venezuela as quickly as March 2019. We had the honor of meeting with many officials of Venezuelan government, civil society leaders, community leaders, leadership of the COSI, the leadership of the Communist Party of Venezuela, and finally the President Maduro. This trip was provided, provided us with uh, much needed concrete information to allow us to defend the Bolivarian Revolution of Venezuela and its legitimate democratically elected government and president much more effectively. The heroic effort to protect the Venezuelan embassy was in fact in initiated by two of our delegation members, Kevin Zies and Margaret Flowers, who are sitting here, <laughs> along with a few other allies. With this act, they took our anti-imperialist struggle in the United States to a higher level. Not only did they engage the movement in a direct defense of Venezuelan sovereignty, but exposed the U.S. imperialism's blatant violations of international law and the Vienna Convention. The whole movement was galvanized around this heroic act. All of our delegate members got involved in various forms from outside the embassy building and significant part of the movement joined this to support the embassy protectors. With the U.S. Secret Service raid of the embassy and the arrest of our four remaining protectors, our struggle has entered into a new stage. Our comrades have been charged with the, with the false charge of interfering with protective functions of the state by the Secret Service and the government which can carry maximum penalty of one year imprisonment plus $100,000 in fines. Although their first round of trials 10 days ago ended in hung jury due to the weakness of the Trump administration. We are still concerned that the government might push for a retrial. So we are now faced with a long-term legal and political battle not only in defense of our falsely charged comrades, 
that also with no less important struggle to expose US imperialism crimes against the people of Venezuela and the whole humanity. For us, this is a very important struggle that hits at the core of US imperialism's in illegal interventions. We are determined to carry this struggle to its final victory. We will be standing with the people of Venezuela and their Bolivarian revolution to the end until we achieve victory regardless of what it takes. But in spite of all of our collective achievements, our peace movement is still too confused, fragmented, and weak to be able to put an end to US imperialism aggression around the world. The main reason for this confusion, fragmentation, and weakness is its lack of general understanding of the nature of imperialism itself. Mm -hmm. Unless we, the concept of imperialism assumes a central position in the peace movement analysis of our current situation, the confusion and weakness will linger on and will keep us, keep the peace movement from achieving its goals. Mm -hmm. What we need today is a unified, strong anti-imperialist front within the peace movement right. to steer the whole movement in an anti-imperialist direction. We have, obvi we have obviously come a long way in that direction. The broad anti-imperialist coalitions and campaigns that we have organized so far during the past decade testify to this fact. But moving forward and meeting the challenges of, that we are facing today requires that we further broaden, unify, and strengthen this anti-imperialist front by giving it a stronger coordinating course structure, one that can bring, up, bring all U.S. anti-imperialist forces and organizations together in a single unified strategy against, against imperialist system itself, not just on various impacts or effects of imperialism. It is my hope that this will soon be realized. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bayman. Our next speaker is Bernadette Ellerin. Um, she is the national spokesperson of the U.S. chapter of, I'm going to get this wrong, uh, Bagang Ali Alan Sang Makabayan. Please re do it for me correct when I get there. Go Say it now. Bagang Ali Alan Makabayan. Which is Bayan USA. <laughs> movements in the Philippines um, and the forefront of the struggle for national democracy with a socialist perspective. Alarin also serves as the vice chairperson of the North America, uh, for North America of the International League for People's Struggle, a global anti-imperialist and democratic formation of 300 member um, groups present in over 40 countries representing national and social liberation movements against imperialism and re reaction. So here, uh, Bernadette also was, up until recently, a member of the um, uh, Administrative Committee of UNAC, uh, but now the present uh, president of Bayan takes her place in that uh, position, and that's Rhonda Romero, who's sitting right up in front. Thank you. Sorry, I hate bios. Um, <laughs> um, no, I just said I hate bios. Um, being red. It's fine. Um, it's a formality. So I'm going to be coming from the perspective of Bayan, which has a chapter here in the US. And um, when we struggle against imperialism, in our context, we're really fighting for national liberation. That's what anti-imperialism is for us. And for many other um, neo-colonies around the world, they're fighting for their national liberation from the clutches of US monopoly capitalism, US militarism, US imperialism. Um, update on the slide. Are we able to get the slides? Yes. It's up. Right. Yes. So, thank you. Surprise. The Philippine government wants to kick out the U.S. troops from the Philippines. Do we support? Yeah. Yes, that's a good call. Uh, but we have to also monitor the basis for why this call is being um, 
projected by the Duterte government at this particular moment in time. Next slide. Um, this is uh, President Duterte who's all over the international news and next to him is um, one of his uh, closest allies in the Philippine Senate, that's Senator Ro Ronald, Ronald Bato de la Rosa, who is um, the former uh, top-notch uh, general of the Philippine National Police, which is funded by the U.S., as well as the main enforcer of the U.S.-funded drug war in the Philippines, which has taken the lives of over 30,000 um, victims in the country. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, the, the call for uh, the, the Duterte government to terminate the VFA, they actually issued a notice to the U.S. State Department calling for the termination of the Visiting Forces Agreement, which is a major um, military agreement between the U.S. and the Philippines, which allows for um, uh, annual rotational uh, port calls, um, um, exercises, war games, drone exercises, uh, rest and recreation, refueling, um, sex industry work um, in, the, in the Philippines because of the U.S. military presence. So, um, and but uh, the Duterte government is calling for its termination because the U.S. Congress has canceled the visa of Bato, uh, that senator, on the basis of his involvement in the drug war and also um, involvement in the incarceration of major critics of the U.S. Uh, of the Duterte government in the Philippines. In particular, another senator, um, Leila de Lima, who's currently incarcerated because she's one of the most vocal critics of the U.S. of, of, of the Duterte government and the drug war in particular. So their basis is the U.S. visa. Our basis is U.S. imperialism. There's a difference between a U.S. visa and U.S. imperialism. <laughs> um, so we have yet to see. Uh, U.S. imperialism in the Philippines. Um, this. A cartoon here is an illustration. It's a racist, it's racist um, war propaganda from the turn of the 20th century to really justify um, uh, the U.S. invasion, military invasion of the Philippines um, in uh, back in 1899. Um, at the tail end of the of the um, the the, U, the Philippine um, victory over Spanish colonization, um, the U.S. came in and launched another its first major large-scale war of aggression for conquest for invasion, for occupation overseas, which was the Philippines. And after that, the Philippines was the um, only uh, U.S. direct colony in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, but now it's a U.S. neo-colony. Um, uh, next slide. So you can see um, uh, how they really use racism to convince people that this <laughs> war is justified. Um, they, and because it was so racist, um, I want to point out, this is February's Black History Month, that many of the black soldiers in the U.S. Um, infantries that were stationed in the Philippines defected uh, to the Philippine side because they found solidarity um, with many of the Philippine rebels. Um, they, they, they recognized the racist character of this war, and because of that, they felt more, they had more in common with the Filipinos than they did with the U.S. military. Um, next slide. So that's back in 1899. Uh, this is more um, recent photos of U.S. military presence uh, because of the VFA and various other U.S. military agreements. The U.S. are in the Philippines because of, um, for, under the auspices of counterterrorism. Um, there are regular war games, regular drone exercises, uh, regular um, rest and recreation stations in the Philippines uh, with the U.S. Next slide. Um, you can see these are just uh, martial arts <laughs> exercises with U.S. troops in the Philippines. Next slide. Uh, so this is a timeline of um, U.S. military agreements uh, between the with the Philippines. So in like I said, from 1899 to 1946, the Philippines was a direct U.S. colony, uh, which was basically a um, uh, a, col a colonial government. And it was really the U.S. colonial government that uh, established the Philippine military. First, as the Philippine Constabulary, and so the armed forces of the Philippines, as it exists today, is um, more loyal to U.S. imperialism than it is to the Philippine government. It, it's supported by U.S. imperialism. It's basically a, a proxy army, a surrogate army, for U.S. imperialism, in not only in the Philippines, but in the region. Um, so in 1947, after the U.S. granted independence to the Philippines in 1946, uh, the U.S. was uh, very clear to establish um, a framework agreement 
the U military bases agreement, which would ensure that the, that the U.S. would have military bases all over the country. So between 1947 and the present, there have been about um, 20 or so uh, U.S. military bases that we know of. Some were official and permanent, like um, Subic Naval and Clark Air Force Base. Some are unofficial and, and de facto, uh, which is what we have now. We have, we have um, unofficial U.S. military facilities that are being housed in Philippine military facilities. Um, in 1951, uh, another major agreement, the Mutual Defense Treaty between the U.S. and the Philippines was established. Again, this is a Cold War era um, anti-communist um, oh, agreement to basically um, uh, stop the expansion of, of, of communism and the influence of communism in the region, um, particularly in the Philippines. Um, and then in 1966, the basis agreement was extended for another 25 years. Um, in 19, from 1998 to 1999, uh, the Visiting Forces Agreement, or the VFA, the one that, um, the actual agreement that the Duterte government wants to terminate right now, um, was ratified, introduced and ratified. And again, this, after the, um, this agreement, like I said, allows for uh, more port calls, more rotational uh, presence, in a way that is, um, can be very insidious, because you don't really know where they are all concentrated in the country. Um, and then in 2000, uh, the first Balikatan exercises were um, established. These are war games, regular war exercises between the US and the Philippine militaries under the auspices of countering um, or uh, fighting off global terrorism. Uh, in 2001, to, after 9-11, the Philippines was named the second front to the U.S. war on terror by the Bush administration. So since then, Balikatan has been uh, annual exercises all over the country, um, has killed many people all over the country as well. Uh, in uh, 2002, the MLSA, or the Mutual Logistics and Support Agreement, was established, establishing that um, the Philippines and the U.S. would equally support each other with their defense and logistics and cooperation. Of course, that's not really the case. It's these, these agreements are one-sided and onerous um, between a master and slave type of relationship. And then in uh, 2014, we have the Enhanced Defense and Cooperation Agreement, or the EDCA, which is another um, de facto basis agreement that allows for um, these cooperative locations where uh, more um, U.S. troops can operate out of different types of facilities all over the country. So there, there are so many, the Philippines is one big U.S. military playground. And you don't really know at any given time where the U.S. troops are based because many of them, most of them are special operations forces. And then I will just add the counterinsurgency operations are another form of U.S. military intervention all over the country. Wherever there are U.S. bases, there are counterinsurgency operations. Next slide. Um, this is a picture of Marawi City in the southern Philippines. It is a Muslim majority city. In the southern Philippines, we have a, we have a, a Muslim minority population that are fighting for their self-determination. They have their own um, self-defense units that are in negotiations with the Philippine government for uh, autonomy. Um, next slide. So the, the Filipino people have been um, struggling against U.S. imperialism and military presence in the country for a very long time, since the time of the, of the Commonwealth era in the Philippines. Um, next slide. And it was really this struggle that's at the heart of, um, of the shutdown of the former permanent bases of Subic and Clark back in 1991. Next slide. So I, I'm here to also say that um, we are living in the era of imperialism. That's bad news. But we're also living in an era of um, intensifying people's resistance all over the world, especially um, revolutions that are being waged for so national and social liberation, like in the Philippines and all over the global south. Next slide. So. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier that we have to understand the character of imperialism as it exists. Um, and in order to sharpen and expand our knowledge of imperialism, it's important to know that imperialism itself, the crisis is endemic to imperialism. And right now, imperialism is an un unprecedented scale of its own crisis. No? On one hand, there's been no real economic growth 
even though um, the financial oligarchy says there is, there's really no economic growth um, all over the world. Uh, and on the other hand, um, this economic crisis spurns <coughs> political crisis, which spurns fascism all over the world. On the other hand, people's resistance is intensifying and not allowing itself to be pacified by the ideological attacks of imperialism. So, so all of this makes for a very unstable uh, character of imperialism right now, which is favorable for those of us in the anti-imperialist movement. Next slide. Uh, so all over the North, in North America and in Europe, next slide. Uh, next slide. In the Global South, there are People are rising up, you know, uh, to take back the land. Workers are stepping out of the factories, calling for strikes. Students are calling, are walking out of their campuses, calling for uh, resistance. Next slide. <coughs> um, the indigenous communities all over the world are also rising up to take back their land from imperialist wars of plunder. Um, next slide. And in many areas, uh, revolution is being re being waged in a in a very militant way through armed struggle, and that is a reality. Armed struggle is a reality of the crisis. It's a reality and it is a, it is a legitimate form of resistance against imperialism. And so I, end, I just want to end with um, sharpening our, our anti-imperialist movement here in the US really does involve international solidarity with all forms of resistance um, all over the globe that are happening. Um, out of necessity, out of people's right to defend themselves and protect their ancestral domain. Um, and so we want to see um, uh, an anti-imperialist movement here in the U.S. that's really in touch and in solidarity with these movements all over the world. Um, last slide. Uh, we should celebrate the resistance happening all over the world. In the Philippines, the New People's Army will be celebrating their 51st anniversary <laughs> next month. Thank you. Venezuela, as uh, Bayman mentioned, one of the things about Venezuela is they have on their people. They are giving <laughs> weapons to the people through the, through the um, communities, and they are training them because they expect this country, the United States, to invade them, and they expect the people to resist them. When the United States says there is closer to the mic. When the United States says that there is um, a dictatorship there, I've never known a dictatorship to arm its own people. And what we saw there was exactly the opposite of that. Yeah. Our next speaker is um, a hero of mine. Um, I didn't tell him that yet, but I just did. <laughs> um, Camilo Mejia um, is an Iraq war veteran and a war resistor. I remember reading his stories and it was so inspiring of what he did. He was born in 1975 um, in Managua, Nicaragua, but moved to the United States at an early age. After five months in active combat in Iraq, Camilla refused redeployment to his unit in Iraq, choosing instead to publicly decry the war as an immoral criminal war of aggression. As a result of his public stance, he was court-martialed and jailed for desertion. Following nine months of incarceration at Fort Sill Military Prison, Camilo was released and became a writer, speaker, and activist in the military resistance movement. His memoir, The Road from Ramadi, The Private Rebellion of Staff Sergeant Camilo um, Mejia. Uh, this is Camilo. I'd like to start by saying that we didn't write our speeches together, I swear. But, uh, <laughs> there seem to be so many recurring themes, uh, which I think it's a testament to the times that we're in. On November 1st, 2018, John Bolton gave a speech in Miami in which he first referred to the uh, Troika of Tyranny to refer to Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, stating that the three countries are causing tremendous amount of human suffering. 
So today, as I sit here and speak to you, I would like to speak to you as a Nicaraguan, a Sandinista, and a proud citizen of the Philippines. Because being a citizen of the Troika means that my country is a main target of U.S. aggression, which means we must be doing something good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And just like the axis of evil speech uh, back in 2002 when George W. Bush laid down what would become uh, U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, this uh, Troika of tyranny speech also has basically laid down the foundations of U.S. aggression towards Latin America. So I'd like to speak a little bit of the context that we're in, even though it may feel a little bit repetitive because of what my um, two colleagues here have spoken about. Uh, but in simple terms, I believe that the uh, time of U.S. hegemony has come to an end. And what we're also seeing is it's actually a lot more serious than that because what we're also seeing is that the uh, neoliberal economic world order also has proven itself to be ineffective and to be causing tremendous amount of suffering, human suffering, as opposed to the Troika. And so, what have these uh, neoliberal policies cost? They have caused gross inequality, uh, environmental destruction, uh, great poverty, disease, uh, infant and maternal mortality, the destruction of countries' infrastructure, the destruction of country's sovereignty. And alongside that, what we have is a world of emerging world powers that are taking a pro an approach that is very different and that is basically grounding its new relationships in, 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 in collaboration, in the rebuilding of infrastructure, the development of new cleaner technologies. And so what we're seeing really is that we're seeing that there's an alternative being created in the face of all this neoliberal suffering. And yet, what we see is that the United States, rather than change its ways and right its many wrongs, um, continues to make the same mistakes and to try to impose its neoliberal policies all over the, um, the American continent and the world. I don't have to convince you that many of the um, uh, disastrous impacts that we are seeing in Latin America and the rest of the world, we are also seeing here. Um, the uh, neoliberal policies of privatization and austerity caused the vast majority of people living in the United States uh, great suffering from gentrification to environmental injustice and destruction to police and state brutality to housing, healthcare, and education crisis. Neoliberalism, not the Troika, is causing all this tremendous human and environmental suffering. The situation, as my colleagues have said, um, my comrades have said, uh, abroad isn't any less urgent. The massive uprisings that we're seeing from Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and San Pedro Sula, to Paris, France, and throughout the rest of the world, are in direct response to the impact of neoliberal policies and the impact that that's um, having on the vast majority of humanity. Neoliberal policies that translate to environmental destruction, morbid rates of mortality, hunger, disease, and war, only to name a few. So here we are this evening, and what more could we possibly ask for than to be able to participate in an anti-imperialist conference in the belly of the beast? In this time of transition of global scale, we are at the very epicenter of that transition, which means that we have to be very aware of the circumstances and historical context in which we find ourselves, which presents many dangers but also many opportunities. And in order to address those opportunities, I'd like to maybe just for a few minutes go back to the Troika. And I'll speak more specifically about Nicaragua. Between the years of 1926 and 1933, the United States used a big portion of its military power, including warships, artillery, and thousands of well-armed US Marines to capture and kill the last remaining of the rebel generals in Nicaragua, Augusto Cesar Sandino. General Sandino gave birth to the popular and anti-imperialist struggle for sovereignty and independence from the United States when he refused to accept terms of a truce that would have resulted in handing control of the country and its resources to the United States. He continued to fight a, a guerrilla warfare in which he and his men were at a gross disadvantage 
Yet thanks to the intimate knowledge of terrain, popular support, and the unbreakable resolve of his patriotic army, General Sandino prevailed in 1933, and since then, the Marines have never occupied Nicaraguan territory again. Woo! However, the United States did not give up. They simply resorted to the use of lies and betrayal to obtain what General Sandino had denied them for years in battle. They employed the services, the services of a bourgeois liberal general named Anastasio Somoza to lure General Sandino into a trap, and he assassinated him exactly 86 years ago today. Wow. But the legacy of General Sandino inspired the struggle for liberation of a revolutionary movement that not only eventually defeated what became the Somoza dynasty, which ruled Nicaragua for more than 40 years, but which also became one of the three governments collectively known today as the Troika of Tyranny. Of course, I'm talking about the Sandinista National Liberation Front, or FSLN, yeah. the colors of which I'm wearing around my neck tonight. Woo! Woo -woo! Woo -woo! And so, when the Sandinista National Liberation Front defeated the US-supported dictatorship of the Somoza family in 79, the United States did not wait long to launch a counteroffensive to retain control and began training and financing the, mer the mercenary army known as the Contras. But since U.S. Congress had banned the funding of mercenary angry, uh, armies, the Reagan administration had to resort to creative ways to support the puppet army, including the sale of weapons to Iran during the Iran-Iraq War, a scandal that became known as the Iran-Contra affair. That was the same war in which the U.S. armed the Iraqi army of Saddam Hussein with chemical weapons which were later used, used against Kurds and the Iranian military and civilian population. Another scheme to keep the war going saw the CIA facilitating the trafficking of crack cocaine into African-American neighborhoods in LA, which became not only a health epidemic but also a social one, as it created a violent drug trafficking environment, causing alarming rates of addiction, mental health issues, unemployment, homelessness, to name a few, all while the Reagan administration cut funding to social programs, including mental health services, housing, education, and other basic needs. When the FSLN lost the general election in 1990, a series of neoliberal governments immediately began to undermine all of the achievements of the revolution, including the land reform, the literacy campaign, victories in gender equality, healthcare, education programs, workers' rights, and much more. The country ceased to be a sovereign state nation to become a cheap market for transnational companies to savagely exploit with no regard to the country's people or its natural environment. A situation similar to the, drug, to the drug epidemic of LA ensued in Nicaragua as most of our citizens lost the safety net that had been provided by the Sandinista government. Mortality rates once again skyrocketed, campesinos lost their land, illiteracy went through the roof, poor children became malnourished, massive unemployment led to higher crime rate, rates and unsafe neighborhoods. And with the sale of the electric company, the country went into a 16-year period of literal darkness. It's going to be more like five. Despite the grim reality that befell Nicaragua for 16 years, uh, the United States government or the U.S. corporate media never reported, much less complained about, the morbid existence of most Nicaraguans during the 16-year neoliberal period. There were no human rights organizations writing reports about the alarming rates of mortality, hunger, disease, or anything else caused the privatization and austerity neoliberal policies. The Organization of American States never expressed any interest in the country, despite blatant electoral fraud overseen by the United States to prevent the Sandinistas from returning to power. It was as if the country did not exist anymore. So today, Sandinista government, in power for 12 years, has been able to cut poverty in half, extreme poverty by two thirds, provide universal health care and education to all our citizens, rebuild our infrastructure, our infrastructure, become one of the safest nations in Latin America, achieve 90% of food sovereignty, increase access to electric power from 54% from to 92%, launch credit and lending programs to support hundreds of thousands of micro, small, and medium-sized businesses that place the country 
in the top three nations in the world in terms of gender equality. Nicaragua, Nicaragua is not alone in these achievements. Under Presidents Chavez and Maduro, despite constant U.S. intervention in the form of sanctions, sabotage, and regime change operations, Venezuela has launched a series of programs designed to promote the development of the South American nation, including housing programs that have built approximately 3 million homes for Venezuela's poorest citizens. Food distribution programs, education programs, and much more. In the case of Cuba, not only has the revolution survived over 60 years of economic, political, diplomatic, and even military war from the United States, they have managed to achieve incredible victories in healthcare and education, not to mention medicine, climate resilience, the development of a sustainable economy, and much more. Of the hundreds of billions of hungry children who roam the world homeless, not a single one of them lives in Cuba. As a revolutionary island, despite decades of U.S. aggression, has managed to completely eradicate homelessness. This is the Troika. But I share all of this with you, not in the interest of my country or Venezuela or Cuba, I'm sharing this with you tonight because I keep hearing people say that the enemy of my enemy is not my friend, or denouncing U.S. imperialism doesn't mean that we have to support dictatorships. Another common one is we must support grassroots movements standing up to totalitarian regimes, even if they once were progressive. So let me tell you something. The enemy of your enemy, namely the Troika nations, as well as other nations who are being targeted by U.S. regime change policies and other forms of aggression are not being targeted because they are dictatorships. They are being targeted because we represent an alternative to the prevailing neoliberal world order. That's right. Which is the same world order that's denying American youth of a bright future, that's destroying our environment, that's turned basic human necessities into products to be bought and sold in transnational markets. We need to build a united anti-imperialist internationalist movement that is capable to understand the historical moment in which we find ourselves. A movement that is capable to tell the difference between an economic model that serves the interests of the poor and not the interests of the rich and transnational corporations. We need to understand how U.S. funded NGOs have seized control of the post-truth narrative of dictatorship and democracy, and how they have weaponized identity politics, human and civil rights to create division among us, and to redirect our solidarity efforts towards the rejection of governments and revolutionary movements that are fighting tooth and nail against the very same policies that are causing tremendous human suffering and environmental degradation in our communities right here in the United States. U.S. imperialism has many allies, very powerful allies, and they are not divided. They don't waste time vilifying each other as they launch media smear campaigns that pave the way for regime change in Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and everywhere else, where they are burning black and brown bodies and destroying progressive programs for the poor under the guise of pro-democracy movements. The same people who flood U.S. streets with drug and violence are supporting efforts to overthrow revolutionary governments. The same people that have facilitated the use of chemical weapons against the Iraqi Kurds and Iranian military and civilian populations and who are demolishing Palestinian homes are funding mercenary armies in places like Colombia and Nicaragua. That's right. And they are behind the narratives that keep us debating the merits and flaws of revolutionary governments fighting for self-determination right. while they stand united in the destruction of our environment, our future, and our ability to live a life with dignity and to fight for what is decent and right. So, to wrap up, I stand here tonight, or I sit here tonight rather, as a proud citizen of the Troika, a Nicaraguan, as someone who has been a Sandinista since before birth, because both of my parents were insurgents Woo! In, the, in the fight against the Mosul. Yeah! and who will remain Sandinista until the very moment I draw my last breath. Woo! And I'm not here to apologize for it. I'm not here to apologize for my government as we build this movement. I am not here 
to request help for our struggle. I am here to tell everyone that your struggle and mine are one and the same. And that if we are to work together, as we should, we must build an anti-imperialist movement that is grounded in a strong understanding of regime change in the 21st century and that is capable to go beyond the cor corporate headline to dig deeper, to reach across beer campaigns and see through the smoke screen of, of imperialism in order to see the values, the values that unite our struggles and that can help us work together as we fight for a better world. Thank you. We're a little bit over time, but of course, um, I'm just going to say a couple of words, and then we're going to have some discussion, questions, um, your thoughts, because we want this to be a participatory conference. That's the way we build the movement. Um, you know, the words uh, that I just heard um, are codified in one of the slogans that UNAC uses, which is, end the wars at home and abroad. Um, because we see the militarization in, our, in the black and brown communities at the borders, um, uh, and we see the attacks on working people throughout this country as well. UNAC, this year, is 10 years old. And this is our fifth national conference, and we survived this time when other coalitions perhaps have not. Um, it was a difficult time. Um, when UNEC was formed at a conference up in Albany of 800 people, um, people were questioning why we needed an anti-war movement. Um, some people actually said, well, you know, Obama's elected, um, and he's going to end the wars. Uh, we thought not so. Um, and um, we thought it was very important while there were troops overseas, um, while the wars were continuing, that we have an anti-war movement, and we put together a coalition that today has about 160 member groups. If your group is not a member of UNAC, there is a form in here, and you can fill it out, and you can join or go onto the website um, and join there. Uh, we need a movement, an anti-war movement in this country today more than ever. And I've been involved in the anti-war movement forever. Um, I started my anti-war activity as a college student against the Vietnam War, and um, I actually was a, a staff person in one of the two major coalitions at the time, the National Peace Action Coalition, that organized some of the huge, massive rallies where millions of people came out a number of times, marched in the streets, protested, used all sorts of tactics. Uh, but it was a gigantic mass movement. But you know, in the beginning of the Vietnam War, it wasn't a mass movement. In fact, in the very early polls in the Vietnam War, they were saying only 8% opposed the Vietnam War. They actually called it the only consensus war in US history at the time. But nine years later, 88% of the American people were against the war. Mm -hmm. So that shows you what we can do, and that's the task that is in front of us. And anti-war sentiment grew and became so deep in the, in the society, especially in the culture, in the youth culture, in music, in the dress, in everything um, that was part of um, living uh, your life at that particular time. And it got down right to the level of the soldiers. And the soldiers, towards the end of that war, refused to fight. It also happened in the context and helped push that context of other struggles that were developing. Black nationalist movement and black liberation movement, Chicano um, uh, movement uh, and the Puerto Rican movement that was taking place, the women's movement, right for abortion, struggle for abortion rights, the gay rights movement um, uh, uh, that took place. And, these movements were changing the consciousness, were part of the changed consciousness of the whole population, and it got right down to the soldiers. And the soldiers ceased to be a fighting force in Vietnam. 
Uh, they refused to fight. Um, they were told, we're going to go take that hill by one of their officers, and they would say, well, you go take that hill. Um, in the last year that the U.S. was in, in uh, Vietnam, there were more than 800 cases of fracking, fr fragging, which was um, people deciding they're not going to follow those people, and they're, if they're not going to kill the Vietnamese, they're going to get rid of their leaders. And they really couldn't fight. Uh, there was a black nationalist struggle that was going on in the military. Yep. Um, no Vietnamese ever called me nigger. There was um, peace signs on the helmets of the soldiers, and the U.S. had to get out. And you know, in the early days when I was young, we were learning in, in school that the U.S. never won, never lost a war. After mm -hmm. Vietnam, they never said that anymore. That's right. That's right. You might remember the pictures of the helicopters leaving and the people that collaborated with the Americans trying to hold on to get out of there. Yep. And they, yep. they put their tails between their legs and, and, they, and the U.S. Um, got out and lost that war and the Vietnamese people won. But at a tremendous, tremendous cost. Four million Viet uh, Vietnamese were killed. About 50,000 Americans were killed. But those costs don't even tell the whole story. The soldiers know who have to go through these stories, uh, the PTSD and the um, suicides and the uh, um, uh, uh, mental uh, problems and uh, alcoholism and so forth that affect them for all their life and affect all of society. We need to end all of those wars. But after the Vietnam War, they developed a, a a word, a phrase that they said it was called the Vietnam Syndrome. It was not made up by the Vietnam anti-war movement. It was made up by the media and the politicians. The Vietnam Syndrome was what they thought was a bad thing. You see, people in the United States didn't want to see, didn't want to go to war again like Vietnam. And so they were very cautious after Vietnam in terms of moving towards wars. Um, and it took a whole generation. And then what happened at 9-11, whatever happened at 9-11, um, to, uh, to turn the population back to a war footing and say, let's go to war. But it didn't last even that long. You know, they invaded um, and occupied uh, Afghanistan and store there um, from 2001 to today, almost 20 years, the longest war the U.S. has ever been in against one of the weakest countries. And the Taliban today has, owned, has more territory, controls more territory in Afghanistan um, than they did at the time of the U.S. invasion. And that's why the U.S. is negotiating with them. Right. Because uh, that's, they, they can't oh. win that war. Even. That's right. um, or the Iraq war, where they went in and invaded. But then they thought, maybe that's not going to be a good thing. You remember February 15th, 2003? Right before we went into um, Iraq, uh, millions came out in city after city after city around the world. A million in London, a million in Tokyo, a million in Rome. We had a half a million here in New York, another 250,000 in, in San Francisco. Um, and uh, we marched and we protested. And the New York Times had to say, well, there are still two um, superpowers in the world. One is the United States and the other is the people that were out in the streets. But the U.S. didn't budge. I got that idea that it was a different time when the mass movement, uh, than the mass movement during the um, Vietnam War, when um, uh, Bush came out and saw all these people. Demonstrations for the first time in history took place in every continent in the world including Antarctica, um, where there are two places where there were populations in Antarctica. One is uh, right at the pole, and the other is at the uh, some base on the shelf. The people that got out and protested, uh, the, the scientists and so forth at the pole, around the South Pole, made a peace sign with their bodies in the snow and took a picture of it in the helicopter. So there were demonstrations in every continent. But Trump came out and said, I mean, uh, Bush, oh, same difference, came out and said, um, 
Sam came out and said, well, it's a good focus group. And they didn't, didn't move them. The demonstrations didn't move them. We never thought a demonstration could move anybody, even a mass demonstration. But a mass movement, demonstrations are part of building a mass movement. And that's what we need to build today, is that kind of mass movement. But it didn't move them because it couldn't move them. The United States today is in, has military in 172 countries around the world. Um, in any given day, US Special Forces are in operation in about 70 countries. Um, the United States has about 20 times the number of foreign military bases as all other countries in the world combined. The military industrial complex, along with the prison industrial complex, are part of the entire economy of the United States. We'd collapse without it. You see all these politicians on these debates, these uh, democratic debates are taking place, making all these promises. Well, you know, with the discretionary tax dollar today, about 64 cents out of every discretionary tax dollar goes to the military. There's no way in the world they can um, uh, do the programs that they're all saying with the other 36% uh, of, of the tax dollars that are going on. It's such a part of the economy, the military industrial complex right now, that our economy would collapse. Imagine, you know, we don't, we say that we are, uh, have a low um, uh, uh, unemployment rate, which is not true. They changed the way they count unemployment exactly. figures, so it sounds low. Exactly. It's just simply not true. But could you imagine if we demilitarized, if we told the soldiers, go home, get a job? If we took the 2.2 million people out of the jails, 25% of the world's population, jail population, is in the United States, and we only have 5% of the world's population and took the two million people that keep them in jails and said, get out, go out and get a, a good job, get an honest job. Could our economy support that? How could it do it? It couldn't do it. Amen. And so they're gonna fight like crazy. And the fight against war is a fight to end that kind of system. Today, we can say something we didn't say during the Vietnam War, that it was difficult to say because there was so much red baiting. We have to end capitalism to end yeah. war. Do it to save the earth. We have no choice. And today, the anti-war movement coming together in a coalition of many, many groups and understanding that there's a war at home and a war abroad and bringing all those forces together under one umbrella into a coalition, many battles, many struggles. We need to support them all. If we can do that, you know, 35, people 35 and, and younger in the United States in their majority despite all the red baiting that's happened in this country, believe socialism is a better solution than that's capitalism. Right. That's right. It's our job, it's our job, it's our job to mobilize that sentiment, to mobilize those forces, to bring together a mass movement together that can change the system, bring us a world of peace and prosperity and no more war um, for all people. And that's what we do. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's what you're all doing here. And I thank you for being here. And if you're not part of UNEC, please be part of UNEC. We need you. Thank you. Right. So now, there's no microphone on the floor, but if people would like to raise their hand, I'll call on people and um, we can have questions. Well, there is a mic. All right, and Sarah's going to pass it around. Sarah, can you, there's some folks over here. Can you? Uh, Get them. And Bayman has an announcement to make also. Maybe while we're getting now, do you want to make that announcement or do you want to wait? Okay. I just want to thank all of you. You were so illuminating and moving and uh, setting the charge for all of us to go forward. And I want to say to what you just said, Joe, that we can totally make this transition if we look to take care of the planet. We could put everybody to work. I mean, when we geared up after, uh, uh, for World War II, we changed all our industry and we just started making tanks and gardens and ships, you know, to, to fight the Nazis for whatever. 
we could be doing windmills and solar powers and uh, you know efficiency and we could have everybody working so it's not so your picture was a little bleak I agree we have to change the whole system but we have the job is right in front of us where we could convince everybody we have all the kids with us already that know this is where we have to go so I hope we put that in our speaking when we talk about ending capitalism, what are we all going to be doing? You know, we're going to be fixing the planet. The, uh, I'm not optimistic because I am very optimistic that we're going to accomplish that, but does anybody else like to comment on any of these? Just take the mic and do so if you do. Otherwise, we'll go and have more questions and discussion. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Asantua Nkrumah Ture. I'm an organizer with Black Alliance for Peace. Um, thank you. Uh, my question to the panelists, um, for the political work that you do, um, how do you explain these ideas to young people? Well, I'll start. It's, it's, e it's not easy because not only was there a break in war for a whole generation, it was a break between the people that organized during my early years and the organization is taking now. And people are under attack because the society, is, the system is falling apart. And people are under attack everywhere, in their communities, in their jobs. The unions are under attack. Women's rights are under attack. Um, and so, it's easy for them to say, well, this is immediately what's in front of me and I have to do it. But it's our job to also make, to broaden that out, that these struggles are connected. We have a similar, we have the same enemy. And not just here, but internationally. There is no national movement that's taking place that doesn't have, have its international component and something's happening. When this stuff happened in Ferguson, the Palestinians sent them, yes. here's how we dodge the tear gas that yes. takes place. Um, and um, that was a, a tremendous international reaching across borders, and that's one of the things that we have to do. But it's, it, it is something that we have to explain. I don't know if that gets you anywhere. I'd like to uh, take a step back, actually, and point out that right now, young people are being brought into organizing and social justice movements within a highly corrupt environment that has been co-opted by corporate money. The entire ecosystem of identity politics is sucking young people into a black hole of neoliberal imperialism disguised as pro-democracy movements. And so we need to rebuild movements and spaces for young people to really learn how to be activists, how to be grassroots uh, fighters uh, against in in imperialism. Um, so I would, you know, I'd like to say that before um, answering your question. And I think that the same way that we have to talk to adults, we have to empower people with the right tools to understand how U.S. imperialism is taking place today. We have to empower people with a historic perspective of all these movements that are being accused of being dictatorships and totalitarian regimes. Uh, we have to educate people on how to tell the difference between a revolutionary economic model and a neoliberal model. We have to uh, train people on how to follow the money trail. We have to train people to go beyond the headlines. We have to train people to go to the actual source of the information and to learn to read between the lines. Uh, because if we don't do that, then we're wasting our time. Well, I, I'm proud to say that um, Buy-In USA is, uh, bulk of our membership are young people, um, and we're very proud members of UNAC. Um, I think the question of imperialism is not a question of generations. It's a question of um, crisis and um, affected communities, and I think in our, in our um, work here, our, the reason why we have been able to um, organize a lot of Filipino American youth in the U.S. is because we, we consciously work to educate, expose, and oppose that our very existence here in the U.S. is a product of U.S. imperialist 
invasion of our country um, and colonialism. So when we expose that fact, many Filipino Americans who um, suffer from um, identity issues, you know, not knowing, not feeling that they belong because the because of um, um, colonial amnesia here, that's in in our education system and even in the Philippines, has erased that history and has never been explained to us. That's a starting point for many of our young people that come out of uh, the schools. Um, I think we also consciously. Um, encourage all of our membership, which are young people again, to, um, to integrate with the poor people in their communities. And many of them come from working class communities. They're working class themselves. But we consciously push those in the universities to integrate with the working class, to proletarianize, to be with the poor. And I think that type of exposure to the very crisis of imperialism motivates many of our young people to want to fight back and wins them over to the anti-imperialist struggle. Well, to me, it's a very critical question at this stage. I was talking to my friend, the comrade, uh, Bill, outside, and I said, Bill, what happens if the old guards die today? Who's going to lead the movement from this point on? Because we are far behind in terms of getting the young people to get involved. And it's a statement of fact. Um, my personal view, although it's a limited suggestion, is that we have to go to places where they are. And to me, one of the places is classes, okay. educational system. We have relinquished that to the establishment. I think we should take those classes back through all of the progressive teachers, academics, and I'm speaking as a retired professor of sociology. Mm. And I give you a couple, couple of examples because I've been teaching courses on imperialism. I've been teaching courses about socialism. Designed them and taught them. Got away with it. <laughs> but I did it. And I give you a couple of examples. I, I designed a course on 21st century socialism and took uh, for the honors of students and took six of my students to Cuba All right. during that course. Woo Interesting example, I mean, thing that I would like to tell you is that on our way back in Havana Airport, I saw one of the girls crying. I said, Michelle, why are you crying? She said, you're leaving Cuba, I don't want to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> True story. People have to see those places. Why don't we organize tours? Take them to those countries. Let them see what they are. I've been teaching courses on imperialism, and i give you one example. It was during the Occupy Wall Street time. I was teaching it in central New Jersey. And I showed them a film on imperialism. Three of them that same night after class packed up and went to to New York that same night on train to participate in Occupy Wall Street. But the jaws drops when you first introduce the subject. They don't know that. And this is the issue. We have to be able to find places or venues or connection link places, link up places, to really link up with the young people. We cannot just sit here in our own organizations and say we should do this, we should do that. We have to really take the steps to go to them, and it's the important part. Thank you. Uh, we interrupt this program with breaking news. Breaking news. Now, sometimes we don't know our own power, or we forget it, or we lose sight of it for a hot moment. But there's been a campaign this past year organized by migrants demanding ICE off the buses, and particularly focusing on Greyhound across the country, and right here in New York at the Greyhound bus station over at Port Authority on 42nd Street. Uh, there have been demonstrations and also at the uh, George Washington Bridge, at the Greyhound bus station, at other places, demanding that Greyhound stop ICE agents from boarding buses. 
and arresting migrants, demanding ID, and also educating people that you can get up and say ICE has no right to get on this bus, and more and more people were doing it who aren't migrants, who, who would understand this and take a big step. And we made it very much part of the demonstration, uh, part of this conference. If you look at the back of every journal that you got, you see that there's going to be a demonstration on Sunday at 4 o'clock, and we all plan to march out of here and over to Greyhound, right? That's, that's on your agenda. Guess what Greyhound announced tonight? Just now. Just now. They, that, it, it, this is breaking news. They just announced that they will no longer allow ICE agents to illegally... ask the, the migrant activists who have been organizing this, who plan to come, this was the last session of the conference on Sunday, how they read it. Uh, it's, it's organized by FIRE, that's Fight for um, Immigrants and Refugees Everywhere. Uh, at any rate, uh, check out the back of your brochure and know that as Frederick Douglass said so many years ago, without struggle, there is no progress. And wow. so this is just an example of some immediate progress, and it's also just part of defending migrants all across this country. We say no to the camps, and no to the cages, no to the raids, and no to the roundups, and ice off the buses. All right. discussion? Larry, and then this man here. Larry Adams from People. Wait, wait, Larry. Sorry. Yes, Larry Adams from BOP, People's Organization for Progress. Um, I want to congratulate the comrades on the most informative, stimulating uh, presentations. And I was real glad to see that they're all written. Because the suggestion that I would make for outreach is to pamphletize them. Put those presentations together. Now I'm old school, you see I write notes with a pen. But the young people that we're trying to reach out to watch YouTube. So things like Fred's tape and other videos should probably be put together as an educational tool and put on online where the young people go. I think that would be excellent task for the coalition for outreach. Because they're worth publicizing. Hi, thanks. My name is Mitchell Cohen from WBAI Radio and Woo! also the Brooklyn Greens. Greens party! How, so when we're talking about, th these are great talks, when we're talking about how the issues link up, that I believe that's where the importance comes out, and it's not only intellectually trying to concatenate the issues, I'll let you be in my dream if I could be in yours, you know, type of thing, but it's recognizing that Venezuela, for instance, is the only, uh, one of the few countries in the world that bans the planting of genetically engineered crops. Right? Nobody knows that. It's a total inroad to the environmental movement. And the way you combine movements is to show what imperialism does and why it's trying, not only for the oil, but to plant huge tracts of genetically engineered crops on the behest of Monsanto and the other giant corporations. So then what do we do about it? You know, what kind, I would like to see more talk about, and there's been great talk here, about what type of direct actions we take. People are now, as you talk, is shutting down uh, pipelines all over the place right now, in New York and elsewhere, Canada, of course. How do we connect that with the other issues as well. I actually think they connect themselves and we just have to just bring that out. 
and just let people see that. So, but I really appreciate this, and I'd like to see more attention paid toward the type of direct action that we do in terms of rebuilding, while we fight resistance, how do we rebuild the type of socialist or community that we want to see take over. The way the Black Panther Party built Breakfast for Children programs. So you're building what you want to see in the course of fighting around it. Thank you. All right, are there other questions? Sandra Decker from Portland, Oregon. Um, in getting into the classroom to the kids, um, I was in California for quite a while in the Bay Area, and one man, just one man, set up tabling at the community colleges against enlisting in the military, and they counted that as pretty strong peace work. Um, in, in Portland, one man, John Grushaw, has set up um, tabling in the schools. He calls it equal access. When the military gets in the school, we get in the school. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're there, we're there, with our buttons and our flyers and talking to the students. Um, additionally, John gets us into the classroom. So when I get back from this, I'll be going into two high school classrooms with another person and engaging the students, so they know that it's an eight-year commitment when they join the military, four years active, four years, um, not inactive, reserve. but, yeah, reserve. thank you, sir. And, um, and that they know if they have, don't have an impeccable record, they aren't gonna get that college scholarship. Um, they, they know that the rape rate in the military for both men and women is much higher than it is in the general public. And we have flyers with facts on it. So they can look it up. I mean, these are facts that we're, um, that we're talking about. So, I mean, that one person in California, one person in Portland could get this set up. It's not that hard to do. And, and it's good to have younger people there, but in Portland, we've got the Portland Raging Grannies going. And so they're into the classrooms um, and, and putting in a lot of hours. So thank you, Professor, for being in the classroom. And we can be there, too. Uh, sorry, just to let you know that um, at the end of the conference on Sunday, we will have a, a, a plenary where we talk about an action program, what we can do, what kind of actions we can do going forward. And I hope you can be here for that and I hope we can um, come up with uh, a good program, which a lot of us have been thinking about um, to go into the future. Can I, can I answer that? Yes. Yeah. And uh, also, I had forgotten that, but one very direct action you can do right now uh, to help us um, oppose uh, sanctions against Nicaragua is to go to... Sanctions. Sorry, a AFGJ.org, and you will find a petition to end sanctions against Nicaragua. Alliance for Global Justice. Alliance for Global Justice website, afgj.org. Thank you. I have a for, question. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Margaret, and then, uh, then we'll go around. I have a question for each of you, because um, each of you have been involved in anti-imperialist work for a while and in other countries and have familiarity with other countries' movements. What um, do you see when you look at the United States as uh, what are some of the serious deficiencies here or things, features of other movements that you've seen that have made them be more successful? You kind of started to answer some of these questions, but what, what is really lacking here that we should be focused on organizing? <coughs> I don't think the answer to that is simple. No, I don't think so. um, But I'll contribute towards a bigger answer. I think um, definitely we have to resolve issues of class and race and, and gender and age uh, within the anti-war movement to be so that's more equitable. Um, we have to also um, um, organize amongst the working class and aspire for a uh, anti-imperialist movement that's really working class led. I think um, we can do more as an anti-imperialist movement, as the anti-imperialist united front to ensure that. I 
think uh, so many of institutions uh, in the United States have been co-opted by money, right? Uh, whether you're looking at public education or the healthcare system, um, or even uh, social justice organizing, they have been co-opted by big money. Uh, so we need to take back our institutions, we need to educate and create awareness, um, and we need to find alternative spaces and funding sources to do our work. We can no longer continue to rely on organizations that draw their money from the very corporations that are causing the problem in the first place. Um, and that's one of the main differences that I would, that I would uh, point out between uh, grassroots movements in Nicaragua. And I'm not talking about the ones funded by USAID or NED or anything. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, but I'm talking about campesino movements, I'm talking about worker movements uh, that don't draw their money from the United States. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, rebuilding our grassroots uh, operation, it's, it's a must. And I think that we need to create our own alternatives for educating, creating news, and then having this very type of discussions. I'm not anti-direct action, I think there's a time and place for direct action, but I think the work is in education and awareness and, and um, like uh, my comrades here have said, meeting people exactly where they are, going to the places where they are, going to the schools, going to the community college and talking, having face-to-face uh, -face conversations with people. And then also one more thing, um, I think it's, it's really important also to make connections between what's going on in, in Latin America and other parts of the world and what's happening here. Uh, the flooding of African-American neighborhoods with drugs being directly connected to the killing of Nicaraguas by the contrast and the atrocities that they committed. We need to highlight those similarities. We need to build solidarity from a personal place. From, from a personal place not only of, of suffering but also of shared struggle. And I think that we're failing to do that. I think that we're looking at these movements, these revolutionary movements and governments as like far away occurrences when they're actually intimately connected to our struggles right here. And I think that we need to make those connections. I would like to add a couple of dimensions to this. So one thing, one observation, you know, I'm coming, I was born in Iran, I was raised in Iran, I just came to the United States for my college education. One thing that probably people don't know here, um, in such countries that are on the thumbs of U.S. imperialism and foreign powers, the culture, the society, the political situation, the economic situation creates anti-imperialism by itself. It generates resistance forces. So you didn't have to buy, read books or, or look at certain videos or films to become anti-Shah, anti-U.S. You were there already as you were growing. Unfortunately, we do not have that privilege here. It's the opposite. We are sailing against the wind, right? So we have to do an extra work of educating people, and I think that's the key element here. And one of the aspects of the education that I think is important, because we have been fighting on all fronts, all of us, in many ways, environment, civil rights, economics, wars, everything. But one thing that brings all of those together, as it was mentioned, that we need a link. The link to all of those is imperialism. If you look at the root causes of every one of them, you end up with the question of imperialist domination of the world, imperialist exploitation. And this is what's causing all of these problems. These are not independent problems. These are symptoms of the same problem. And these are, this is the issue that we have to explain to the public. <clears throat> that unless you pull that, that link, you cannot change the situation. People fight for the environment, and then additional regu regulations leads companies to fire workers because their expenses go up. Now, they set workers against environmentalists, right? McDonald's, I mean, McDonald workers raise the minimum wage to $15. Immediately, all McDonald's automate the ordering system. You have seen this. They can just flip the, the issue. You raise the, the wages, and it immediately reflects in the price of commodities. 
So unless we grab the whole situation at once and deal with the system that does this, not only with its symptoms alone, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. What I'm saying is that we need that unified anti-imperialist front that deals with all of these as one and the same problem and addresses the core problem of it, which is imperialism itself and capitalism. And we have to do a huge educational work on this. Otherwise, calling to action without people knowing what they're getting into or what they're fighting against will not get us very far. That's what I'm trying to say. I agree with what everybody said. I agree with what everybody. Can I just answer? Because I. Oh, go ahead. You haven't had your turn. Never mind. Uh, I agree with what everybody said. Um, it's difficult, you know. When we were in um, Venezuela, um, at one point, at one point, um, we were not able to leave Venezuela because the U.S. planes that fly to Venezuela would not fly. And the reason they wouldn't fly was because they said there was chaos in the streets. There was an artificial um, blackout that the US engineered. But what was interesting was the people were not rioting or looting <laughs> when that happened. One block, actually, everybody got together on the street and had a party. But they organized themselves to get uh, water because the water pumps wouldn't work and to make sure that the people in some of the high-rise buildings these high-rise buildings, by the way, the government um, uh, has made with names like Malcolm X and Che Guevara for people that don't have homes. Uh, they've provided homes for many of them. But they brought people up and it, they, they had a sense of community. We walked through the streets and didn't see any of this stuff. Um, and so the narrative that the American people were getting was that, that there was um, uh, chaos in the streets um, of Venezuela. And there was no chaos in the streets of Venezuela. So we actually got together and made a video where each of us spoke and tried to get it out through social media. Mm. But it is very difficult. We can use social media, but my social media account has been blocked many times when I say the truth. Um, and the corporate media, you know, has a monopoly. And the educational structures, yes, we can say something in the, in the classrooms, but they're not going to tell you the truth overall. It's just a little glimpse of light that people get, and that's important, very important. It's just a little glimpse of light. So organizing is a really important part of this whole thing. And I discovered that I learn more organizing and in action than I do in most classes. I think it might be my problem because I'm a little bit of ADHD and stuff and I have a hard time listening sometimes, but um, we have to have an activist movement. We have to be out in the streets where when they say there is no opposition or there's nothing, people will see that there is an opposition. We have to build an infrastructure throughout the country so that when something happens, like when um, uh, Trump sent that drone and um, killed the uh, person, the, uh, the leader, Soleimani, in, in, in Iraq. I mean, everything was wrong with that, everything. There's no right to kill anybody in Iraq. There's no right to kill Soleimani. There's no right to do any of these things. But people got it all of a sudden. And we called for actions. And you know, actions took place in 200 cities. That was bigger than we've had for a while. So they got it. When you're doing the thing we have, which they don't have, is what they do is against the interest of the vast majority of people. And all their lies and all their cover-ups, which they do very, very well, um, when you get through to that, we have the potential of organizing those people in, in a way that can really stop uh, the government. So education, all this kind of stuff is very, very important and all the outreach we do. But we also have to be an activist movement. If someone's just sitting home and signing a petition, they think they're the only one on the petition. If they're calling their senator, they think they're the only one doing it because the media tells them you're not like everyone else. But it's not true. The polls show that the majority of people in this country are against war. Our job 
is to get to them, is to mobilize them, to talk to them, to tell them the tactics and strategies, work with them to understand and learn the tactics and strategies that they can build a movement. And we'll find education. In, whenever there has been a mass movement in our country in the past, it had all sorts of implications. There was theater and cultural and poetry and songs that came out, and these are educational ways too. It's not just through lecture. So, anyway, thanks. Uh, more discussion. Uh, I, I see a, a man here and um, and a woman there. So can we? Okay. So let's do this woman and then this man, and then we'll, we'll get a couple more. We have about a little bit more than a half an hour, and then we're going to have some really good music. So I hope having all this discussion through you. Thank you. Um, hello? Hi. Um, my name is Janine Polanki. I'm from Vancouver, Canada with Mobilization Against War and Occupation. And I'm very excited to be part of this conference this weekend. Um, and with all of you working on so many different important struggles and bringing them all here together. Um, as, uh, as, being, as what has been discussed, you know, how do we build a united, strong, effective anti-war movement? And um, as has been brought up in various points, is that needs to be international. And that's why, as someone coming from Canada, I'm here. That's why our organization is part of UNAC. And, you know, the governments of Canada, of the United States, of all of these imperialist countries, they are working together um, they are fighting these wars uh, against our brothers and sisters around the world together and that's what we need to be doing is working together uh, to combat that. Um, so more international solidarity, cooperation, coordination um, of, between different groups and organizations is really I think what we need to see. On the, another point about getting youth involved, um, of course this is the crucial question of our movement and so many great avenues and, and ideas have been said, but I think one thing that is part of the, the theme of this conference is the environmental movement, and we're living in a very unique and important time when the environmental youth movement is a large part of that being led by youth. Um, but it's up to us to make that bridge and make that connection between environmental issues and anti-war and anti-imperialist issues. The, Military is one of the biggest polluters in the world. Um, this is the environmental degradation is is built on a system that is going for profit rather than human needs and, and environmental issues. So it's up to us to also make that bridge. So I look forward to the rest of the conference with everyone here. We have one more speaker, the man over here who raised his hand, and then we're going to see if anybody wants to sum up, and then we're going to go to music. Comrade. Okay, comrade. Comrade. Hello. 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 Peace for all. Thank you very much for UNAC and the panel at this moment from me, a teacher, young actress, and the guy who remind me the struggle in Nicaragua. Thank you very much. I'm here to share with my feeling, I'm a Secretary General of Pakistan, USA Freedom Forum. We are not a bit like you, but we know how to respect all of you, your struggle, and your work for peace. And you create this atmosphere, a person like me, who, got, who can learn something from you to be a good person in this coming society and in this society. One thing I feel in my whole life in Pakistan and over here, when any activist afraid to listen critics, afraid to listen what he's doing and somebody wanna say to him that you make mistake, but you are not up to the standard, that's the end of every struggle. I hope this UNAC conference will talk about this thing as an adult, that why we are at this moment in this, in this condition and why continuously powerful people who has a weapon of mass destruction, not to the kill, the kill you, but to kill your future, your brain, your thoughts. I'm blaming, sorry teacher, in this country, 
education system has failed to make you, to create you as a human. We can create you as a good successful person, but not the human. I'm sorry to tell you, it's a sign of thing. I'll give you one example, our activism. We are just like this society, United States society, anything which is good for, good to sell, we join them. Like a Palestinian problem, like a Cuba problem. But I will ask you, how many people feel any feeling when there's a 200,000 people since 1947 killed in Kashmir by the Indian army? Feel it, touch your heart. Touch your heart how you know this thing, how you feel about that thing. Because it was not popular. Now that 8 million people is in house arrest since 2019, for 5th of August, curfew, nothing. They are not a 21st century human treated by the lives of the United States, Mr. Modi, extremist group. I'm going to ask you, please add something in this conference. Teach us that what we have to do, then the Modi government, who is extremist Hindu with an atomic bomb power, and the region which has the three atomic countries, Pakistan, China. And I think that region needs your attention, sir, because that's the future plan of this capital society. One thing is very clear, Joe Lombardo, we thankful for you, thankful for Sarah Flanders, thankful to these kind of people, Media Benjamin, but we need more people. That's why they are not united. What kind of personality conflicts? What they want to do in the 60s, age of 60s or 70s? What they're going to get more? Let's talk openly. Find out the reason. Because the future is in your hand of my kids. Thank you very much, Junak. Thank you, Burma. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. And thank all of you. Thank you so much. There's one other guy who has hand up for a long time and it's been brought to my attention, so if we can just listen to him and then we'll, we'll move yeah. on. Hi, I'm John Catalanato. I'm one of the editors of Workers' World newspaper. I wanted to thank the speakers for setting a, a strong anti-imperialist framework for the anti-war movement that we're trying to develop now. And I especially want to thank the speakers who brought up military resistance, because that's one of my favorite topics. And Joe spent a lot of time talking about the Vietnam uh, situation, Berna, about uh, the, even the, the resistance in 1899 in uh, the Philippines. There were uh, black U.S. soldiers who joined the, uh, the movement of the Filipinos to, to fight for national independence against the U.S. And Camilo, of course, uh, personifies military resistance. And I'm interested in it, and I also wrote a book about it, <laughs> and I want to make a little advertisement for it, because if any of you want to find out about the stuff Joe was talking about in more detail, uh, about the military resistance during the Vietnam War, and about the role of military resistance in general, uh, I think it's worthwhile, and here's, for those of you who still get information through books, um, it would be a worthwhile way of finding it out because it also shows the relationship between military resistance and the possibility of smashing the capital state, which in the end is what we're going to have to do if we're going to bring about a movement that really ends war. Thank you very much. Final remarks, anybody wants to make? Go on. Yes, I wanted to take this moment to <clears throat> announce, not for those of you who don't know, um, as a continuation of the same, same discussion that we are having tonight, I wanted to announce you, to you that uh, a joint effort by Coalition Against U.S. Foreign Military Bases and the World Peace Council is going on and we are organizing a conference against imperialism. That is a shift from our anti-basis conferences into the main core issue of imperialism. This conference is going to be held in Cyprus from March 27th to 29th. We have at least four, five, six of the leaders of UNEX speaking, actually. Joe Lombardo. Ajamu Baraka, Kevin Zees, Margaret Flowers, 
uh, set of founders. I hope I haven't missed anybody. But it's a it's a very important, unprecedented event because we are bringing forces from around the world. We're going to be discussing sanctions. We're going to be discussing war. We're going to be discussing nuclear weapons. We're going to be discussing the environment. So all of it is going to be covered, and then we're going to be discussing every continent separately on a panel. What is imperialism doing to that continent? So I want to encourage all of you to consider traveling to Cyprus. Get your tickets if it's, I mean, early enough. It's not going to be that expensive. The website for the conference where you can get all the information is cyprus-conference.org. Very simple, you can't forget it. Please take a look at it, and I really encourage you to join this conference. It's unprecedented. We want to create a global anti-imperialist front, and this is the purpose of this conference. So, culmination of our efforts from hands of Syria coalition all the way to, to the present. It has been a joint effort of all of us, all of the organizations, and especially UNIC and the U.S. Peace Council. So I really encourage you to join us in that. Thank you. Um, I'll just briefly uh, thank again um, the organizers of this conference for inviting us to participate. I'm very honored to be speaking with these comrades next to me. Um, a lot has been said about the need for um, increasing and strengthening our international solidarity work. I couldn't agree more coming from a third world country um, that's a neo-colony of the U.S. Um, but I think as much as we study imperialism and, and know it and know its internal character, we also have to study um, the reality of rising revolutions all over the world. And to do that, this is not information you will see coming from schools. Uh, this is not taught in any textbook, in any curriculum under the neoliberal system. It's not ever going to be shared with you in the news. It will always be branded as a terrorist organization, these, these um, struggles for national liberation. How we practice people-to-people -people solidarity on a global scale needs to be intentional, concrete, and tangible. Meaning to say, go. Go to the areas. You know, the U.S. is the richest country in the world. Um, go to the areas where um, the people are facing the brunt of U.S. imperialism, where the plunder is happening, where the wars are happening, where the militarism is happening. We need to go there and express solidarity with the people suffering over there and study how they resist. And maybe we can learn something of how we can resist here and sharpen our movement here. Um, I think um, we need to build a, a movement that really investigates and doesn't make assumptions about what's happening, how we conduct our struggles overseas. A lot of this assumption is actually what divides us. And we are also naive to the fact that imperialism itself is built on an offensive of ideas that they, they attack us with to make us believe that our resistance is small and ineffective when in fact we outnumber. We actually, globally, we out resistance outnumbers um, the enemy, no? So I think we need to come to really close the gap of inf information, really uh, resist the pacification of our ideas, our militancy uh, coming from imperialism and really work to build these tangible um, multilateral uh, formations where we can actually come together and meet each other face to face and shake hands. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here tonight and uh, I, I really meant it when I said that this is really wonderful to be here with all of you and to have the opportunity to have these conversations. And uh, I, I'd also like to make a shameless plug for tomorrow's regime change workshop, uh, which is going to feature a speaker from Nicaragua, a good friend of mine, who will be talking about the popular economy that we have there and the role of women uh, in peasant farms and how our food sovereignty has really worked as a sort of bulletproof vest against sanctions because they can hurt us, but they can kill us because we're able to feed our people. Uh, so that's a very radical thing, very, uh, uh, amazing uh, achievement of the revolution that I think that we should be doing right here. That we should be able to grow our own food and go from farm to the table. Um, and it's just like one of the main things that you can learn about. Uh, look at the program and think of the things that you're not very aware of, that you're not very knowledgeable on, 
and go to those workshops because we really need to up our game and we really need to be educating other people. So let's do it. Thank you. So um, we're going to have some music and while the musician sets up and I'm going to turn this mic over for a, min a minute to um, Kevin who's going to introduce her, Kevin Zeese, who um, uh, is also her um, uncle. And um, uh, so there's be, while she's setting up, there'll be some music, but we hope you'll stick around, listen to the music, um, and um, talk to each other, get to know each other. There's a little bit of a social period before we end, and the rest of the conference is gonna be very important. Some of the issues that we talked about here, on sanctions, there'll be a panel. Black Alliance for Peace is gonna lead a panel on um, the elections and the movement and how we relate to the elections. Um, and there's going to be a panel on defending our movement, talking about the people who uh, were in the embassy, talking about Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning and the other people who have stood up. And our movement is under attack more than it has been in a while. And we have to come together. That's an elementary duty of all of us, is to defend each other when we are under attack. So I hope you'll be here for all the workshops on a number of issues. Um, for the rest of the uh, conference and join us and thank you for being here tonight.